Hi, and welcome back to Guide at Hacking. Today, we are going to take a look at the Stack 6 challenge from Exploit Education's Phoenix. This time, instead of completely overriding the return address of a stack frame, we are going to utilize a partial return address override in order to hijack the control flow, redirect it to our shellcode's address, and obtain code execution. Taking a look at the source code shows that the binary checks whether the environment variable exploit education is present using the get environment function. If it is not present, an error is thrown and the application exits. Otherwise, the value of the environment variable is stored in the pointer variable and gets passed to the greet function. The greet function first of all sets the max size variable to the length of the string stored in who which is the function parameter holding the value of the environment variable. Then max size gets checked if it is bigger than the size of buffer minus one, so bigger than 127. If it is larger than 127, it is set to the size of buffer minus one, so 127. Afterwards, a string copy operation is performed to copy the contents of the what variable into the buffer variable. And then the second string copy operation is used to append to the buffer. This time a maximum amount of bytes specified by max size is copied from who into buffer. Because of the way the boundary check is implemented, this will actually not prevent an overflow, which is why we are most likely able to overflow the buffer variable by the length of what since the buffer variable already stores that content when copying the who variable into buffer using the maximum amount of max size. To check what is stored in the what variable, we could either use GDB or, for example, binary ninja. Here we have the main function, navigate to greet, where we have the first string copy operation. Going to what shows that it stores welcome, I'm pleased to meet you, and a white space, which corresponds to 34 bytes, which means we can overflow the buffer variable by 34 bytes. Though this time we are only using a one byte overflow to hijack the control flow instead of overriding multiple bytes or the entire address. To get started, we use GDB and load stack six. Now, so that we don't have a mismatch of the stack within GDB and outside GDB, we have to unset two environment variables that only exist within GDB. The first one would be the columns environment variable and the second one would be lines. Now to fulfill the boundary check, the first check, we have to set an environment variable called exploit education and we set that one to 127 A's. Then we can use the disassemble command to disassemble the main function and set a breakpoint at the leave instruction. Finally, using run, we can start the process and continue up to our breakpoint. Here we see that we hit the leave instruction and scrolling up a bit, we see that the last byte of the base pointer, the RBP, is hex 41. Now, of course, that could only be coincidence, but if we change the value of the exploit education environment variable to, for example, all Bs, it'll be hex 42. What we are going to do is exploit the combination of the leaf and the return instruction. The leaf instruction will move the content of the base pointer RBP into the stack pointer RSP and then increment it by eight. So single stepping through the instruction up to the return instruction shows that RSP now contains EE49. This is because 41 obviously incremented by eight equals 49. Then the return instruction will take the address from the stack pointer and return to it. In order to achieve code execution, what we want to do is return to the beginning of the value of our environment variable, as we have plenty of space there to put some shellcode in. To do that, we use the search command and look for exploit education. This brings back multiple results and we could narrow it down by appending an equal sign, but it's obvious that we want to use the address on the stack. This is because the other results, for example, the first two, are part of the code segment of the binary itself. 
So we have this address where our environment variable is located and we want to take a note of that one. The problem is that we don't want to return to that address, the 4a one. This is because we don't want to execute the string exploit education equals as code, but only the value of the environment variable. So we have to increase the address we want to return to by the length of exploit education equal sign, which corresponds to 17 bytes. When adding 17 or hex 11 to that address, we get the following 5b address, which we can also inspect in memory. 5b contains hex 41414141, which is obviously the current value of the environment variable. Now we have to find a pointer that points to either that address or somewhere after that address if we use an opslet as a landing pad. To do that, we rerun the process up to the leaf instruction, and here we inspect the current stack. As we can see, there is actually exactly the address we want to return to at this offset, which would be 7FFFF, the E28. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the leaf instruction will take the value of the base pointer and put it into the stack pointer and then increment it by 8 before the return instruction is executed. This means that we don't want to put in the 28 address into the base pointer, but the 20 address, which will then, after executing the leaf instruction, result in the 28 address being stored in the stack pointer. If we compare this address with our current base pointer, we just have to control the last byte and set it to hex 20 instead of hex 41, which will redirect the code execution to the beginning of our buffer. To get started with actually exploiting the binary, we write a Python script, this time using Python 2, because Python 3 requires you to specify the encodings, which for simplicity we will just leave out this time. First, we introduce some shellcode to simply spawn a bin sh shell, and then we introduce the buff variable. First things first, we want to create our knob sled as a landing pad. Obviously, this time this wouldn't be necessary, but if you've got the space and it doesn't screw up your exploit, you can always add in some knobs. Afterwards, we append the shellcode to our buffer, and then we append 126 characters minus the length of the current buffer. Now, in total, we have written 126 bytes to the buff variable so far, and the very last byte will be the hex 20, which is the byte we want to put into the base pointer. Finally, we simply print the buffer, and then we exit GDB. We can use export, exploit education, and then the dollar sign, Python 2, home, Kali, desktop, stack6.py, to execute the script and set the exploit education environment variable to the output of the script. Afterwards, we go back to GDB, unset the environment variables columns and lines, disassemble the main function to retrieve the address of the leaf instruction and run the application. As we can see here, the base pointer currently points to ffde20 this time, and after stepping through the leaf instruction, the stack pointer will contain 7ffdE28, which points exactly to the address during the beginning of our payload, so 7ffefef5b. And as we can see here, this address contains a bunch of knobs. So we can return to that address, and as we can see here, our knob sled gets executed. Continuing the execution will print a warning that process, process ID is executing a new program, user bin dash, which means that we successfully executed our shell code and obtained a shell. Now, if you paid attention to the environment variables and unset the columns and lines variables before building your exploit, you can now also quit GDB and simply execute stack 6 outside GDB, which will also work and we obtain a shell again. So this time, instead of completely overriding a return address, we just overwrote one byte of the base pointer, and then using the combination of the leaf and the return instruction, so the function epilogue, we successfully hijacked the control flow and achieved code execution. This technique has some flaws, and if you want to read more about them, you can check out my blog post on the guided hacking website. But there is also an advantage, and this is that the ASLR mitigation only randomizes the base address of a module. It doesn't randomize the offset from the base address to a certain function, so if we just override one or a few bytes, depending on the scenario, we wouldn't have to leak the base address of the module first in order to return to somewhere in it. 
as we can just override, for example, the last byte as we did here, and by that bypass ASLR. That's it for the technique of partially overriding a return address, and I hope to catch you again in the next part of the exploit development series.